salaries, we did this, we did that. Um, and uh, they just didn't have the will. The people didn't have the will to look after themselves and to manage themselves. And after a while, we had to go, we had to leave. They just didn't have the will. Since I met 15,000 troops in Afghanistan, we brought it down to 2,500. I didn't see why Americans needed to go to Afghanistan and fight a war for people who are not willing to fight for themselves. And this is the summary of America's position on Afghanistan. But Afghanistan is just not the only thing. There's Al-Qaeda here and there. There's Boko Haram here and there. There's the challenges in North and South Sudan. There's the challenges even in Lebanon, even till today. There's the challenges in Iraq, Iran. There's the challenges generally in the Middle East and even in our own dear Libya here. And then echoes of what happened in Congo this year in the time of King Leopold of Belgium and all sorts of things all over the place. These are things we want to look at. And our guest today is a historian, an author, a publisher, a corporate lawyer, and a public speaker. Let me repeat that. A historian, an author, a publisher, corporate lawyer, and public speaker. He attended the London Metropolitan University and got his LLB in 1984. And then the Inns of Court School of Law the Lincoln's Inn for his call to the English Bar, 1985. The Nigerian Law School, 1986. The London School of Economics and Political Science for his LLM in Company and Commercial Law, 1987. The, Institute of Chatter the Chartered Institute of Taxation of England and Wales uh, to become a chartered tax practitioner and then worked in London as a tax expert. Uh, with Price Waterhouse Coopers, and then a solicitor since 1991, and joined the London headquarters of the global law firm Hogan Lowell's LLP as a corporate tax lawyer. He became the first chairman of the African and Caribbean and Asian Lawyers Group in England. He left Hogan Lowell's in 1997 to combine his first calling as an advocate with his corporate law experience by establishing the first and still only African-owned corporate law firm in England and Wales, the London-based Akin Palmer LLP. He then established the Oum law firm in Nigeria. Our guest enjoys self-expressions as an author and, is the, and has a membership of the Society of Authors uh, with several books to his name, which include The Law, The Lawyers and the Lawless, The Ostrich Nation, Oyibo Came to Africa, A Slave Ship Called Jesus, and His History of Nigeria, A Fatherless People. Very, very interesting. Please welcome with me, Mr. Dele Bogu. Dele, you are welcome and thank you for all that you have done thus far and for accepting to be our guest today. I don't know if my introduction of you has done sufficient or has been sufficient in exposing who you are, but maybe you want to tell us very briefly a bit more about yourself, why you did law, why you are now an author, why you are now into public speaking and that story of the slave ship called Jesus. I want to hear the story. Thank you, Dele. Over to you. Thank you, Pastor Itua. Um, in actual fact, the introduction uh, almost bored me in its length. Uh, that's how I'm sympathetic to everybody else who was listening to it. If I, the person being spoken about, was bored after a while, I have extreme sympathy for all the others who were inflicted uh, with all that detail. Uh, but uh, yes, I'm speaking unusually from the ground. I uh, arrived in Lagos uh, uh, last night, and I'm very happy to join this platform to discuss the issues uh, of the moment. Uh, the only particular point that I'll pick up is the slave ship called Jesus, because of course, 
uh, this platform being a platform of believers led by uh, Parsi Ichwa, the immediate reaction is that how can you call a book and title a book a slave ship called Jesus? But my answer to uh, those who raised this challenge, including my mother, who is the head of one of the largest uh, care of women seraphim churches in London, uh, my explanation is that it wasn't me who called the slave ship the Jesus of Lubeck. It was the evil slave traders uh, who, having a choice of vessels to deploy in this uh, wicked enterprise, uh, decided to uh, blaspheme, if you like, and uh, deploy a ship called the Jesus of Lubeck. But the Jesus of Lubeck was not alone. There was another ship called the Grace of God. Now, like you, uh, having been raised in, in the faith, like you, when I came across uh, the, the names of these vessels of evil, it jarred me and it caused me to reflect what exactly was going on that induced and persuaded these people that they could use these vessels so named in the pursuit of this trade in human souls and human flesh. And what I discovered was that the ship in question, the Jesus of Lubeck, was actually owned by the British royal family. It was owned by King Henry VIII, uh, but it was not used as a slaving vessel at that point uh, because the English had not entered the slave trade at that point. The slave trade, uh, the European one, uh, was instigated by the Portuguese and, uh, and, and the other partner in crime initially uh, was the Spanish. Uh, uh, England only entered under the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. And it was uh, uh, that queen who charted the vehicle to the pioneer of the English slave trade, uh, Sir John Hawkins. And it sailed to uh, Sierra Leone on its first journey. Mm -hmm. And it, they kidnapped uh, 400 African souls. And it sailed off to Haiti, uh, where they were sold uh, for a princely sum. And uh, the queen uh, uh, earned a return of 60% on her investment uh, on that vehicle, on that, on that venture and was then thereafter persuaded that uh, this trade was actually quite good. And, and the rest, as they say, is history and England became the leading slave trade. But the book is much more than about the physical ship. It is about the state of faith in England in particular, but in Europe in general. Because you see, we were portrayed as the savages and the uncivilized who required to be civilized. So it caused me to reflect what was the state of faith in these countries that participated uh, in this trade. And I was surprised to find that the people were extremely religious. Uh, church attendance was at a very high level, not just Sundays, almost every day of the week, and it was almost compulsory. So it caused me to reflect, how do we reconcile this paradox between people who are going to church each, almost each and every day, and yet participation uh, in this uh, trade in evil. And what I found and what I explained in the book in summary uh, is that there was, one has to distinguish between the people of Britain or England on the ground back home and those who were active in the trade because the trade was taking place offshore, away from prying eyes, a bit like Guantanamo Bay. If you recall the abuses of human rights that happened in Guantanamo Bay, uh, had those things happened on the American mainland, in fact, they could not have happened because they would have been restrained. But when uh, they were a, a, a part of Cuba, Guantanamo Bay was sectioned off for this uh, practice of evil and the abuse of human rights. It was well away from um, the uh, prying eyes of the ordinary civilians. 
And that was the case also in the case of the Atlantic slave trade, uh, that it was taking place on our lands, and then they were being shipped across uh, to the Caribbean islands, uh, and that's where the evil was uh, taking place. So uh, that's my explanation. And people say, well, you wouldn't dare to write such a book if there'd been uh, uh, the Arabs or the Muslims. And my answer to them is this. If the Muslims, uh, who were uh, the real pioneers of the African slave trade, let's keep that in mind, and I do deal with this in the book. In fact, their trade started way before the European one and it ended, if at all it has ended, and we may touch on that later on, uh, it ended uh, long after. Uh, but the fundamental difference between them is this, that they were not using ships called the Jesus of Lebec. They were conveying uh, our unfortunate peoples across the Sahara. And had they uh, had the audacity and the temerity to uh, use vessels and name them in uh, uh, names that should suggest reverence and faith and goodness, uh, then I would have had no hesitation in, in addressing or writing a book uh, along those lines as well. But nevertheless, they don't get off. I do deal with the uh, transatlantic slave trade. So that's enough for me by way of an introduction uh, and explanation and defense of uh, the book, A Slave Ship uh, Called Jesus. But the book is further read, but let me say this last thing. Because one of the things, issues that concern me as a historian was this, that if the abolition of the slave trade was an exercise in morality, such that the people of Europe, the traders, decided that they've come to the realization that this is wrong, this is evil, this is not God's will. And bear in mind the missionaries were very uh, much at the forefront of the campaign for abolition. The question that I was asking myself was this, why then did colonization follow immediately after and on the back of abolition of the slave trade. It suggested to me that there was no moral revolution at all, because when one thinks about the evil of colonization, which subsists up to this very day, because as the, as the, the comparison, in the slave trade you were enslaving individual Africans and abusing them in the process for profit. But in colonization, you are enslaving whole nations. And you're not just enslaving nations on the basis of one generation. You are enslaving them from one generation to the next. So our great, great, great grandfathers, our great grandfathers, our grandfathers, our parents, ourselves, our children, we're all still suffering the consequences of that colonial intrusion into our way of life. And it was an evil far greater even than the slave trade that we need to understand that. And the book explains the crossover, the real reasons for abolition of the slave trade, which were political and commercial, not moral, and how the campaign for abolition was then used and exploited to uh, advance the political agenda of colonization. So, uh, pass it to You better stop me because otherwise I'll, I'll keep going on. Yeah, yeah. Can you please explain what the um, real reasons for colonization were vis a vis the comparison with ab uh, uh, abolition of slave trade? I very, very, I very, very much agree with you on your analysis, and it's one of my thoughts also. Um, can you dig a little bit deeper into that? And then maybe also, maybe I can challenge you to think that where would Africa have been had we not been colonized? What do you think? Yes, I, I'll, I'll deal with both of those. Let me deal with the, the real reasons um, 
for abolition and uh, colonization. The trade was going on swimmingly, uh, even during the era of what they called the Enlightenment in Europe. Because of course the Enlightenment was the era of high level thinking. See the profits from the slave trade had made possible a high level of in quote civilization. They now had uh, lots of books, uh, newspapers, journalists. Uh, this was the information age. This was an age of intellect and great thinkers were coming through. But none of those great thinkers who are mentioned when they discuss the Enlightenment, not a single one of them thought about this slave trade and said, this can't be right. So what then happened? What was the trigger? The trigger was this. It was the loss of America in the American War of Independence. Because the Americans understood that it was the super profits from the slave trade that made the Industrial Revolution possible. When you have super profits, or you're, for example, the offspring of uh, highly successful people, the surpluses that you inherit or come into enable you to take a longer view of uh, the issues of life. You are able to indulge some of the, um, some of the fancies uh, that you may have been entertaining, if only you could get away from your nine to five job. You might have fancied yourself as a writer or as a singer, or indeed as an inventor. So it's those super profits from the slave trade where labor was free that now made the industrial revolution possible. It was funding all the institutes of research, whether into medicine, whether into technology, whether into transportation, all aspects of it. And the Americans knew that. And the Americans knew that uh, with uh, the original 13 colonies, if they could make the breakaway, they had the resources to sustain their independence. And that was their calculation. And so when um, what triggered the abolition was this, that if you think back to the Declaration of Independence in 1776, it was a bit like the Declaration of Biafra. The uh, reaction of the government, the British government, was you will not go. We will not allow you to leave. Whereas in the Biafra struggle, the territories were proximate. In the case of the American War of Independence, they were divided, of course, by the Great Atlantic Ocean. So how many troops could the British carry across the ocean to go and fight the Americans in their own homeland, in what had become their homeland? Clearly limited. So what did the British do at that point? They turned to our people who were then in, in that uh, condition of slavery, and they made them a pledge and said, fight for us. When we win, we will free you. Now, the cardinal principle or rules of the slave trade was this. There were two. You never teach the Africans how to read, and you never teach them how to use weapons. And the, 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 the prohibition against teaching them how to read of course, extended to the Bible because the gospel of the, uh, the commonality of man and all children of God is the last thing that you want uh, your enslaved in Bible. So the, ban the banishment upon reading extended and most particularly uh, to the Bible. And as I said, the other cardinal principle, you never teach them how to use weaponry because of course, with uh, when power is equal and balanced, it's very difficult to enslave as, uh, another man. And so the pledge to free the, uh, our people if they fought for the British was a, a departure from the, the, the ethics of the slave trade, if you like. The 
the Americans were outraged by this promise and decided to retaliate. And they sent to the enslaved of our people in America. They said, fight for us. When we win, we will free you. And so both sides now had our people fighting on both sides. Learning, trained in the use of weaponry. And at the end of the war, of course, when the British uh, uh, were defeated uh, and the Americans uh, won, you then had this body of Africans. What to do with them? These ones who were now trained in the use of weaponry, modern weaponry, who had, if you like, like a man-eating tiger, had now tasted uh, blood for the first time. That white men also die if you shoot with these weapons. So they had a problem in their hands. And, uh, but is in the nature of uh, the European peoples that once their wars are over, they put their heads together again to say, how do we deal with this common problem? And the solution to that common problem was that because neither society, neither Britain nor the Americas were ready for a multicultural society, Indeed, they still struggle with a multicultural society today, let alone uh, in 1776 or 1783 at the end of the war. So they put their heads together and said, what shall we do? And the answer was repatriate. And where do you repatriate them to? Back to Africa. Where in Africa? So they sent uh, their so-called travelers, explorers. This is where the reconnaissance of our continents uh, started to go and find the most appropriate land where they could uh, dump the, our unwanted peoples. And this is how Sierra Leone uh, became uh, the first colony of the British on the West African uh, coast. And Liberia became the first colony uh, of the Americans uh, on the same coast. But they were comparing notes. And this is what the book brings out, the, the dialogue and the collaboration um, that was taking place between them. And the missionaries were now uh, enlisted uh, in the exercise because what the book explains is that by virtue of the, the wealth that the slave trader generated in their societies, they were not going to church as before, you see. Uh, the level of church attendance had dropped. The clergy, who were once the most powerful in um, civil society in, in these countries at the beginning of the slave trade, uh, they had now been relegated to, into the background. But now they were needed again. They were needed again because there's a book called The Slave Trade and Its Remedy. It's uh, out of print now, but you can still Google it. Uh, written by a Thomas Fowle Buxton, uh, who uh, was a lead thinker on the British side in terms of what to do with the slave trade. And with the trigger of uh, the abolition, which was 1807, very important to bear in mind, the difference between abolition of the trade, which was 1807, and abolition of slavery, which did not come until 1833. But they had to start str the strategic thinking in terms of what do we do next? And Buxton's uh, recommendation uh, was colonization. He didn't call it colonization. He simply called it the remedy uh, to the slave trade and to be applied liberally across West Africa, all the areas that had been afflicted uh, by the trade. So under the guise of coming into uh, for the colonization uh, project and all those um, travelers, the Mongo parks, etc., were all part of that exercise, the reconnaissance uh, exercise that needed to be done to find a way around. This takes me to your second question, which was, where would we have been uh, had colonization uh, not happened? 
it's the book does actually contain some uh, very interesting quotations, not from us, because you know our people, if we were the ones who said it, our people would be inclined to disbelieve it and disregard it. But it was not us. It was them at a time when they had no reason to even anticipate that we would be reading those texts. This was a discussion amongst themselves. This was evidence that emerged in the course of the debates in the Houses of Parliament over the abolition of the slave trade. And this side that were campaigning for abolition with this, some of them with the secret agenda. I'm not saying everyone who was campaigning for abolition, many of them were sincere. They didn't know what the underlying game was. Those who need, it was always on a need to know basis. But in the course of those speeches, statements and evidence emerged about the condition of our lands before the European intrusion. It was peaceful. We were at peace. And why would we not be at peace? I know some of our people find that difficult to believe, but think about it. Even now we have a superabundance of nature, the blessings of nature in our villages. The mangoes are rotting on the ground. We have too much for our needs. The yams, the bananas, whatever nature required, or whatever we human beings required, nature provided. They even ran the narrative, and we bought this. In their books, hardly a history book about Africa is complete without talk of cannibalism. But think about it. Why would we have been eating each other in such a land of abundance? In paradise, does anybody eat another human being? And if we needed meat, well, if Africa is renowned for one thing across the world, it's the superabundance of wildlife. What is it that you're in need of that you cannot find? If you want exotic meat, you'll find them. So it can only be the insane and the mentally deranged that would stoop to the level of eating fellow human beings. But contrast what was happening in the early days of Europe, in those harsh winters that few survived if they did not strong enough to put food aside uh, for their people. I don't need to go further for it. Just leave it to your imagination. The coach and then the other narrative that was, has been pushed was that we were always killing ourselves. But what would we have been killing ourselves for? Is it more mangoes? Is it more yams? Nature was kind to us, too kind to us. And it was precisely because it was too kind to us that we did not have the weapons of human destruction which they had, which then gave them the competitive edge when they came to our shores. Because when they came to our shores, they found people living in peace. And to quote one of them, peace and idleness is what we were living in. But what's wrong with that? You don't need to struggle in paradise, do you? And ours was paradise. So the first visits were always very civilized and civil visits, because at that point, they do not know anything about us. One of the books that I was lucky to come across in writing a spaceship called Jesus was the logbook of Christopher Columbus, the diary that he kept when he made that journey across to the Americas. And the modus operandi was exactly the same. When at last they landed in Haiti, he actually believed that it was uh, Asia, India. You 
You see, because what led to the Columbus journey was the fall of Constantinople to the forces of Islam on the 29th of May, 1453. Constantinople, since that fall, has become an Islamic territory. We now know it as Istanbul. But Constantinople, before the 29th of May, 1453, was the capital, the new capital of the Christian Roman Empire. It was Emperor Constantine who had converted to Christianity and had moved the capital from Rome and moved it to Constantinople. But it was 1453, 29th of May, that the force, the Ottomans, conquered Constantinople, which had a consequence of blocking the trade routes from west to east because it was across Constantinople that the Europeans used to make trade India and Asia. So when Columbus was now looking for a new route to India, when he found land, which turned out to be Haiti, he thought he was in India, which is how the term West Indies emerged. So all this is explained in the, in the book, A Slave Ship Called Jesus. Uh, it is not blasphemous, it is historical, it is educational, and I commend it to you. So I hope that has answered your question, uh, Pastor Israel, as regards the state uh, of our country, of our lands, uh, before the colonial intrusion. And had uh, we been left alone, uh, we would have uh, developed organically as other nations had developed. Uh, and you would have seen the strong Yoruba nation side by side with the strong Edo nation and the strong Ibo nation and the strong Hausa nation, etc., etc., etc. That would have been truly wonderful if we had been allowed to develop organically, no matter how slow, in that um, era of peace that you have described. We have something we want to show and then take a few pointers or questions on it. Uh, I don't know if the back room is ready to pull it up. If you are not, I can ask our guest another question that's burning on my mind at this point in time. And that is how the fatherland group came about and the fatherless people. But here we see the picture of the United States saying that Al-Qaeda and ISIS are looking to make an inroad into southern Nigeria, it is saying. And I'm, we're going to be asking you to speak on that a little bit further down uh, this conversation. But let me just um, look at the issue of the fatherland group. What does it mean? Uh, what is it about? And also this issue of Nigeria being a fatherless nation. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Um, I suppose all the books that I write tend to have uh, uh, provocative titles. And a fatherless people uh, also calls uh, reactions when people first uh, came across the title. They objected, we're not fathers. I have a father, I remember one particular person saying, I said, but you misunderstand the title of the book. It is not speaking to we as individuals, whether we have biological fathers or mothers. It is talking at the political level. But there's a parallel and a crossover between what one expects of a biological parent and a political father or mother. In both
both cases, in the case of the biological parent, the responsible parent is the one that looks ahead to the road ahead of his offspring or her offspring, or should I say their offspring. Looking to identify their talents and position them to exploit their talents and to play to their strengths and to be the very best they can be in competition with the offspring of others. Political fathers and mothers should be no different. We are their political children and their job should be to identify the strengths and the weaknesses of our people, the Nigerians, as we are called, and position us to compete with the rest of the world to the very best of our ability. Now we see that happening in a narrow field, but largely no thanks to government. We see it happening with our sportsmen. They were there at the Olympics. And you see how we compete with the rest of the world. You see it amongst our entertainers, the whiz kids, the Davidos, world beaters, when they are allowed to perform to the best of their ability. But when it comes to the area that should matter most, which is the cerebral and the intellectual, there is a conspiracy against the educated Nigerians. It's a long-standing conspiracy. It was not initiated by our political leaders. It was initiated by the colonial intruders. And why would they do so? For obvious reasons. If they could, going back to my analogy of our sportsmen and of our entertainers, if there was a way in which they could cripple their performance, rest assured that they would, so that they would not be collecting the gold medals or the platinum discs when it comes to the, the podium of honours in those respective fields. But because they can't do that, because that is an area where it is individual skill that is paramount and there's no political or government intrusion. But when it comes to education, the cerebral, there's every scope for interference, for crippling, for handicapping falsely. It depends what you teach because inputs drive outputs. What goes into the head shapes the conduct. And so when the colonials were coming in and setting up their structure called Nigeria. Rest assured that it was the product not of accident or accidental design, but deliberate and purposeful design. To dis there was express discussion and decision on who to hand power to? Is it going to be the educated ones? Or is it going to be the others? Is Nigeria to use computer analogy that I like to use from time to time? When you have two operating disks, you have to decide which disk are you going to run with? Is it the disk of competition and excellence? Or is it the disk of connection and physical or military power? Now, they had the experience, bear in mind that, uh, and, and this is an important lesson for us to take away, 
It is dangerous for us to view our situation in isolation and think that our experience is unique because the empire was broad. The empire was much more than Nigeria. But the imperialists were narrow. They were few in numbers and they were operating out of the same center, the colonial office in London. And so you can expect as intelligent people that they do not need to reinvent the wheel. All they need to do is to perfect the design of the wheel, learning from the experience of other territories and places. So India had become a colony long before Nigeria was constructed in 1900. Human beings across the world are the same. Every territory has its mix of the educated and the stupid, of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the empire is nothing more than decisions and choices as to who to deploy in what positions and with what responsibility. So where mistakes were made in India, uh, those mistakes were not going to be repeated in uh, Nigeria. So in India, they had uh, learned that the, uh, there was an area of India where uh, they took to education very, very strongly. And those ones were the ones who were causing them trouble. You are given power to lawyers, journalists, and other intellectuals. And they said it expressly. I wish I had a quote at hand. It was actually a quote that I found in the biography of Lord Lugard. It was a concern expressed by Lord Salisbury. He was British Prime Minister at the time of the Berlin Conference in 1884. And he said it explicitly, that we're given power to those who can hurt us. Hurt us in the sense of our agenda, which is the colonial agenda. And keep in mind the colonial agenda is a commercial project, nothing more. It is not an exercise in charity. Empires and colonies were supposed to pay for themselves. It was the resources that were available to be extracted that funded the colonization and the empire. And so priority was given to territories that were highly resourced. Priority being to hold on to those territories. And this is very relevant when we now bring the discussion down to Nigeria. The highly resourced areas as against the less resourced areas. Now, keep in mind, resources at this point are two kinds. There's the intellectual resources and then the physical resources. The physical resources are in the hands of nature. Some areas were more endowed than others. The intellectual resources, everybody has them. North and South, East and West. Nobody has a monopoly of intelligence. Human beings are the same fundamentally in design. But the accidents of the distribution of resources meant that the South was in a position of those enslaved Africans, which was dangerous to educate and show how to use weapons. Because if you did that, you will struggle to hold on to them. And in the early stages, as I explained in the book, all this I'm saying is all explained in a fabulous people. 
they realized that they were making a mistake. In their words, they were repeating the same mistake as they had made in India. When they had allowed education, the wrong type of education. So they decided to change course. And this, it will interest you, was the origin of the concept of Boko Haram. Does that surprise you? It was the origin of the concept of Boko Haram. Because when they were decided, this was 1911, what form of education should we push in the North? In the South, it's too late. These missionaries have allowed people to be educated. But in the North, because bear in mind the, the conquest of the North came quite late. It was at the time the protectorate of Northern Nigeria was declared on 1st of January 1900, there was no British political presence in that area. It was more like a declaration to the rest of the world leave this area alone, it is ours. But the work of constructing the colony, Northern Nigeria colony, had not started. It started in 1903 with the assault, the beginning of the attack on the Sokoto Caliphate. And it ended in 1906 with the defeat of, the, of Sokoto so that was the, the genesis of the physical uh, occupation of the North. But the South had taken much longer, not because the South was physically stronger. It was because of the geography of the South, the forested South, it would fight in their way in would have been like the Vietnam War. If when you read the slave ship called Jesus, you will see how our people, the Africans in Haiti, defeated the British army and won their freedom. They initially won their freedom from the French because Haiti was a French colony. Nobody ever wins freedom all by themselves. There's always some external help. And at that time, our people got help. This is Haiti I'm talking about. They got help from the British. Why? Because the French had helped the American settlers to take America from France, from uh, America from Britain. So this was payback. So Toussaint Louverture and his, in inverted commas, slave army were initially assisted uh, by the British. But it was a calculation that once Toussaint and his uh, slave army win and defeat the French, it will be an easy thing to take the island of the Africans. And this is what William Pitt, the younger, prime, he was the prime minister at the time. This is what he tried. But they were defeated. Our people won. Now, if Hollywood was really interested in blockbusters, all kinds of blockbusters, the story of Toussaint Louverture uh, would have been a Hollywood blockbuster by now. The story of what? Toussaint. Toussaint is his name. Toussaint Louverture. Okay, Toussaint Louverture. Toussaint Louverture. He, he was actually, there's a book out that's called uh, The Black Spartans. That's one of the biographies uh, of, of the man. A, a formidable story. But it was particularly relevant for us and I wanted to bring it to the attention of our people because we've been learned we've been led to believe 
that we are powerless and helpless. But these were Africans who defeated first the French slavers in Haiti. That's why Haiti was the territory where slavery was first abolished, not by any instrument of parliament, but by the enslaved themselves. By the enslaved themselves. I think that was 1894. And then they defeated the Spanish because the island of uh, Haiti joins uh, the uh, Dominican Republic. And the Dominican Republic was Spanish and the slave trade was going on there. But Toussaint unified the island after defeating the French slaves. And then uh, the British, as I said, decided to try and take the island off them and reinstitute the industry and the practice of slavery. So even whilst the abolition speeches and William Pitt, the younger, was speaking in Parliament, advocating abolition, at the very same time as he was delivering those speeches, he was sending an army of invasion to Haiti to take the island off our peoples and to reinstitute slavery. Because that was a promise that he made to the the French who were still on the island to say, fight with us against these rebel slaves, rebel Africans. And when we win, we will reinstitute slavery. But unfortunately, uh, unfortunately for us, uh, our people won. And then what happened next? Napoleon Bonaparte decided that this indignity of African army defeating the French and taking this island was unacceptable. Now Toussaint actually offered him a deal and said to him, look, yes, I've abolished them, but I've unified the island, I've taken uh, Dominican Republic uh, off the Spanish and I've unified the island. And the island is now prosperous. If you want to know what African governance would look like, but for if we were allowed the space, the story of what Toussaint Louverture did in Haiti is what to look at. Because Haiti he made his people work after liberating them. He made them work now as free people. And Haiti became one of the richest territories on the earth. And at that point, Toussaint said to Napoleon, I've stabilized this place. I've secured it. I will be president. I've drawn up a constitution. I will be the first president and I will be president for life to stabilize this place. Bear in mind, Toussaint was in his 40s at this point. After me, other presidents will have five year terms. I am loyal. And he said that because the, at this point, the Americans and the British were actually encouraging him to declare independence from France. But he resisted the invitation. And he offered Napoleon this compromise. Napoleon rejected it and raised an invasion army of 43,000. He made peace with England in order to leave him free to face Haiti. And in an invading army, with an invading army of 43,000, he thought that he would beat our people. Now they tricked Toussaint into a peace meeting. And when he came to that peace meeting, because he was always diplomatic, when they came to that peace meeting, they kidnapped him and sailed him off to France and imprisoned him in the French Alps. You can imagine an African being imprisoned 
in the French Alps, in those stone prisons. He died of pneumonia within nine months or so. But they, by doing that, when word got back to his people in Haiti, they had unleashed a terror because the new leaders realized that they cannot be trusted. And it is a fight to the finish. And it was a fight to the finish. And our people won. And unfortunately, they took their revenge on the remaining French that were on the island. It was a no mercy. I can't give you all the details, it's all in the book, all the details of that fight. But it was ruthless on both sides, with the French bringing in man eating dogs to set on our people because it was winner takes all. So when our people won, they killed the French that were remaining. Those who could escape, escaped. And that's when the Republic of Haiti was established in 1804 as the first independent black state. But then the international community put their heads together and said, what shall we do with this rebel territory? The white supremacists simply could not afford to accept that that should be the end of the story. And they ganged up against AT. And that's why AT now we see as a place of acute poverty, when they were blockaded and embargoed by all the European nations that nobody would trade with. Um, but the history of Haiti is, is a lesson. But I cite that as an example, as a counter to the narrative that Africans cannot rule themselves or cannot govern effectively and cannot fight and cannot win. They fought, they won their freedom, it was not granted to them. The French parliament, of course, on the back of Toussaint's declaration of the abolition of slavery in Haiti, the French parliament then uh, declared the end of slavery, the formal end of slavery in all their islands. So the irony is that uh, one of the points I make in the book is that the French were actually the first, if you leave Toussaint aside, of the European powers, the French were the first to abolish slavery. Not just the slave trade, but slavery. But they lost the lead. This was 1785, they abolished it. The reason they lost the lead and the bragging rights was because of what Napoleon did, Bonaparte did, when he decided that he was going to take Haiti back and reinstitute slavery. So it's a great story and it has so much relevance to what we need to know in order to get ourselves off our knees on the road to where we truly belong. Ours is not the perfect story that we've been carrying around on the conventional history narratives, because it's not for them to tell our story. It is for us to tell our story. And I was fortunate to leave, well, I haven't left law completely, but the skills of research, and particularly the skills of a trial lawyer, in terms of investigating evidence and reading between the lines because you have to be able to read between the lines. That's why there are official secrets, even to this day. There are files that are still closed and classified. So it is down to us to join the dots. I regularly refer to Nigeria as a crime scene. And there's Kelly a crime scene, a crime scene. The skeleton is buried everywhere. And it is down to us to uncover those skeletons 
and bring the real story out and not run with the surface level narratives because that's the easy way. My approach to writing history is always to support what I say, as in the court of law, to support what I say with evidence. And thankfully, most of the evidence that I come across is not written by our people, is actually written by their own people because it's in their nature that they will always write about it. Sometimes it's just coded. And if you read enough, you start getting the picture, the whole picture. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. And you keep looking, but a jigsaw puzzle with a million pieces. And you've got to be patient and find one piece after the other. And then you find the picture forming, the real story of our people. A happy people, peaceful people, because they were contented people, a spiritual people. But a colonial intrusion set us off course. And this is what the book, A Fatherless People, explains. We were rendered fatherless because although, as the book identifies, there are 371 ethnic groups in this Nigeria, in the space called Nigeria, those 371 were effectively decapitated by the colonialists. Every ethnic group had its leadership structure that had sustained it over the generations. I remember going to the palace of Alafin of Oyo on one occasion and found him reading cabinet government in Yoruba land in the 70s. Finding different skills. Oh, no, no, are you? you, you know, Thank you. Sorry about that, Dede. Yes, cabinet governments in Yoruba land in the 1700s or the 18th century. We had democracy. You see, we're led to believe that democracy is something that was brought to us. But democracy is universal. When you go to our villages, because the, the fundament of democracy is actually know thyself. When you know yourselves, you know who the crooks are, who the unprincipled are, who the selfish are, and you also know who the visionaries are. And it's from that knowledge of your candidates that you choose who will represent you. This is how it has always been in our villages. We all know that. That when the village meeting takes and somebody has to be given responsibility for resources which we have pulled. You know full well that the one who is the offspring and the descendant of a thief will be known. And the one who has been, who is the descendant of a principled household will also be known. And we make rational and informed decisions on that basis as to who to entrust with responsibility and with power. Democracy is no more complicated than that. It only gets complicated and messy when we seek to practice democracy on an artificial and mega scale, where actual and direct knowledge is relegated to proxy knowledge and what we lawyers call hearsay, where you haven't, you don't actually know the person, but you're acting on what you've heard about them or what you've read about them, but you don't actually know them. And of course, once you have an electorate running into millions, let alone hundreds of millions, where newspapers are not affordable uh, by most people. And even if they were affordable, the newspaper editors are often compromised from the top in terms of what they will publish and the stories that they will run and who they will give publicity to. So we're running this mega democracy with artificial knowledge. 
knowledge. Not artificial intelligence, not AI, but artificial knowledge. We think we know, but we don't know. This is how we ended up uh, voting for a President Buhari. Until he shows his true colours, as he is showing them now. And we're all lamenting and say, oh my days, how did that happen? But it's not his fault. He simply played the system and said, vote for me. I will give you sweets and candies and life will be nice and rosy and comfortable. Naira will be one to the dollar. <laughs> well, he's right. It's heading to 1,000 to the dollar. He only just left the zero digits off there. You'll soon be at one to the dollar. 1,000 to the So this is a reality. This is what's why in the book, A Fabulous People, I had to dig deep. I could see the crisis coming. And I could see that our people had not been given the information that they critically needed in order to navigate these trouble, troublesome waters that we now find ourselves because as I say, knowledge is power. That's the real power. It's not the AK-47. It is knowledge. And if you invest our people, this is why I'm glad that the spiritual leaders are now beginning to engage with these issues. Not that they were completely disconnected, but the critical aspects of not just spiritual education, but civic education. This education in terms of history, in terms of politics, in terms of civil society and civic order. This is the vital education by which our people will be free. And educated people, truly educated, not um, by education here, let me be clear. I'm not talking about degree certificates and PhDs. I'm talking about self-education, real knowledge that we need and that we use to navigate these troublesome waters. Wisdom is not a degree certificate. You find it amongst our people in the village. If you listen to I'm not saying all villagers are wise, but you get closest to the pure knowledge, not the one that has been somehow diluted by abstract theories and concepts, etc. Let's go back to basics. But more importantly, let's share knowledge. And this was the genesis of the fatherland group. It is a derivation from the book, A Fatherless People. Most of the members of the platform have read A Fatherless People because my object was to cut through the, what I call the beer parlor political discussions, which is uninformed. It is all hearsay. They simply have not sat down and done the research. I read over 80 books from books on the history of India to Mein Kampf, the biography of Adolf Hitler. You'll be saying, what has Adolf Hitler got to do with Nigeria? <laughs> well, uh, one of the uh, compromises that was put forward uh, by the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, to head off the Second World War was that Nigeria will be handed over to Nazi Germany to add to its former colonies, Cameroon, Togo, Namibia, and uh, I forget the other one, I think it's Malawi, that had been confiscated as part of its punishment for starting, or well, being adjudged to have started the first world. So the deal was, we will give you back your former colonies and we will give you Nigeria as well. So, but Hitler wasn't interested in colonies in Africa by this point. 
he wanted landing in Europe. But one of the points that I'm making a fabulous people is that when you're looking for the real reasons for the First World War and the Second World War, for that matter, it was actually about the colonies. It was us and India because it was a war between the haves and the have-nots in terms of empire. By virtue of what I explained in a station called Jesus, those who had been lead players in the slave trade got the extra reward of evil in terms of colonization because under the excuse of cleaning up the mess that they had left behind, they now got the opportunities to colonize those territories. But it meant that countries like Germany and Japan, who were not active in that trade, had insufficient land or judged themselves to have insufficient land relative to these imperial powers. Russia had enough land, when you think about the scale of Russia. China had enough land. America now had enough land by virtue of the misfortune of the Native American peoples. Britain had the empire, French, France had its empire, Spain too. Germany looked around and said, what have we got? So the real reason there's always a difference between the excuse for war and the real strategic calculations for war. It's a bit like the weapons of mass destruction. That was the excuse for war, but not the strategic calculation underpinning uh, war. Thank you very much, Dile. Thank you for that very, very deep and incisive analysis. I'm going to be taking a few questions now from those on the platform. But before I do that, I want to stay us a little bit into what we had put forward as our topic for today that we haven't even touched on, to be honest. But I guess what we have spoken about is very, very important. And I want you to look at it from three, two or three perspectives. Number one, uh, even till today, a lot of us Nigerians keep saying, let's go to the IMF, let's go to the IFC, let's go to the World Bank. What is Britain saying? What is America thinking? Blah, blah, blah. But these were our colonial masters. And the colonial war between the British and the French, and now the Americans, what they did in Libya, what they've done in Afghanistan, what they've done in, uh, in, uh, in uh, all sorts of places, Iraq, Iran, everything, they still have those colonial interests. Therefore, what really should be our attitude to this so-called first world or whatever it is? Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, our president ran all the way to Britain ostensibly to attend some conversation on agriculture or education or something, uh, this and that. Met with a few people in a room. They did some photo ops, blah, blah, blah. And we keep going back to them, Babangida, started the structural adjustment program that was initiated and directed and masterminded by the World Bank and the IFC and all manners of people like that. And this will keep coming back to pontificate over us, telling us to stop corruption, stop this, stop that, stop the other one. What is their real agenda? And what should be our relationship with them? That's question number one. Question number two is, how do we resolve our problems in Nigeria. And then question number three is, what do we learn? What's the situation? What happened in Afghanistan? And how can we learn from that situation? If you can just take those three questions very, very quickly in little blocks uh, so that others can ask questions. Somebody has already raised their hands even before I asked them to. So I guess a lot of them have a lot of questions to ask. And then, of course, there's a question as to where can they get copies of your book? You know, I think you have some very, very incisive books. I think I have a copy of The Fatherless Nation. I'm not sure if I've read it. I won't tell a lie. 
but if I can get another copy to help me. So three questions. Uh, I want your quick responses and then I will open the floor. Thank you. Okay, let, let me answer the easiest one first, where to get the books from. Uh, uh, Rovin Heights and um, uh, what, what is the one in Parkview? A quintessence. Quintessence. Yes, Quintessence and Rovin Heights uh, have the books. Um, where your question is how can you say that again? Is that it's an online. online. It's an online. Okay. Go ahead. The question nicely brings us to the issue of Afghanistan. I, 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 yes, I should say it's on Amazon as well. Uh, both Amazon.co.uk and Amazon.com. Uh, and failing all that, you can always go to my personal website, Deliogun.com, uh, and order from from there. Uh, your questions take us nicely to the relevance of. Um, to the title of this discussion, The Lessons from Afghanistan. Um, and you first started with, uh, should we be talking to these people, these colonizers? And my answer is that we have to. We have to, but we must in doing so recognize that they fall into two groups, just as we fall into two groups the good and the bad, amongst the British people, the French, the Americans, the Germans, the majority are good people who simply do not know, just like us, we have not understood what is really going on. We ran with the narratives that the newspapers and the books have been selling, the narrative of these guys are always just killing themselves. They're just uncivilized. It's just the way they are. They're corrupt. Um, how did um, uh, that, that prime minister, British prime minister describe it? They're fantastically corrupt. It's just the way they are. But they're people. The only people they're ever afraid of is not you and I. It is their people. And what they're afraid of is their people understanding what is really going on. That is the only fear that they have. One of the uh, books that I've just published is the story of uh, Harold Smith. Remember, he there was an interview of his that went viral recently, uh, where he explained how the British Colonial Office rigged our independence elections to put Balewa and Co. in power. And of course, it's that kind of story that they would not want their people to know. And they told him, you know too much. If you publish the book, if you write the book, you will never be published. So he never lived to see his book published. And that book, explains exactly the genesis of the corruption in our electoral system, the rigging. Because once you know that the way to win is not to have better policies or better ideas or better orators, it is simply to rig and to use money to rig the process. And if all else fails, you use the weaponry to seize power then why are you going to play by the rules? Those who play by the rules, it becomes a mug's game. And that was a story that he wrote in his book, which we've now published, the Harold Smith story. And that's also available in, in the same sources. So let us not think that we do not have friends out there amongst the British people and the Europeans or the first world generally. We do. What we have to do is get past the guard. And the guard is strong because their newspapers, unfortunately, are all locked into the 
central political agenda. So you've got to get past them. Even getting books into the bookshops over there is extremely challenging. But always remember what Toussaint Louverture and his enslaved Africans faced in comparison. What we're facing is a picnic uh, in comparison. Now, Afghanistan. This is why we must talk. We must use every avenue available to talk to those amongst them who would listen. I was fortunate in 2008 to meet um, an Afghan paramount, paramount chief by the name of Ajmal Khan Kazai. He was speaking uh, at a meeting of an organization that I'm a member of, the European Atlantic Group. And he was speaking on the 2nd of April, 2008. He was introduced as a tribal chief. Now, it's important to understand this detail. And I, one of the points I make at the conclusion of a fabulous people, the, the mischief of the deliberate use of different languages and different labels to same situations. So this word tribe is very dangerous because when you hear tribe, you're expecting a nation next, a tribe of which nation? So in our part of the world, the exploited part of the world, the colonized part of the world, nations are called tribes. Even though the same political arrangements in the colonizing part of the world, they will be called nations. So the Welsh at 1.2 million are a nation. But the Eurobirds, 50 million, Ibo's at 30 million, and the Hausa at whatever the precise number is. They are tribes. So keep that language in mind when I'm referring to this tribal chief. These were actually nations. You see, Afghanistan has many ethnic groups. You have the Tajiks, the Uzbeks, the Hazaras, the Turkmans, and the largest of them, the Pashtuns. These were self-governing units at one point. Now, let me, to illustrate the parallel between the Afghan story and our situation, from which we may get some lessons in terms of where we're headed, if we're not careful, if we do not act urgently. This was uh, Chief Khan uh, speaking in 2008 uh, to this meeting. Uh, in, it was in the House of Lords, one of the rooms of the House of Lords, uh, but it was to the European Atlantic Group. He said, and bear in mind he's speaking in 2008, the condition in the country is worse some reports say in the West that 30% of the country is under government control. If lucky, in fact, it is 30% of just Kabul. The government, unfortunately, is inefficient. It is certainly not doing what needs to be done. It is involved in widespread corruption and in unlawful activities. Democracy does not mean only that people go to vote. Democracy has values. Those values have to be understood by the people. And that only, and that only comes with education. Unfortunately, at present, 80 to 85% of all our people are uneducated. How would they know what democracy is all about? 
what democracy means on the ground, what democracy is delivering in Afghanistan in the minds of the average citizen. And I say this with apologies to ladies present, is drinking alcohol and womanizing. We have a perfectly acceptable form of indigenous Afghan democracy. People in the West have failed to understand this. We elect our chief from our tribe. As I said, use that word tribe with qualification. Then he goes to a local government. It is much the same thing as you have with a councillor from your own region that you elect, and then they go to local governments. That Afghan democracy, which he called the lawyer Jirga, the lawyer Jirga, is a very ancient form of the democracy. And it has worked for us for many centuries. This is not just in my opinion but in many, many opinions in Afghan society and around the world, it is the vital solution for the presence in Afghanistan. We need to take the whole nation on board. What does that mean? It means that we have a population of 30 to 40 million Afghans who at the moment are not on board. They do not have representation in the present government. That is why the people are not siding with the present government. They're going against the government. We have warlords in the present government. This is an open secret. There are people who have committed atrocities against the same nation that they are representing in the government. Can we begin to see the parallels? Here's another passage. The people must have their genuine voice heard. How is it possible that we are having an election in 15 to 16 months in Afghanistan? Consider that there are 34 provinces in Afghanistan. Out of those 34 provinces, 12 of those provinces are completely insecure and in the states of warfare. 146 districts are under the constant attacks of the Taliban. How in the world are we going to have a fair and clean elections? Suppose for a moment that in England, with half of the country insecure, how can you have fair elections? We believe in democracy, but in a different form of democracy. We believe in the democratic elections for the nomination of the right people who are not corrupt. How are you going to have elections in a country like ours in which almost half of the country is insecure? There is no stability. Provinces are controlled by the warlords and the drug barons. And listen to his prophecy. He said, in fact, I should Quote this, this illustrates how they were beforehand. He said, allow me to correct a common misapprehension that the Pashtun tribes are only in the south, southeast and east of Afghanistan. This is not the case at all. Or that the north of the country is peaceful. There are Pashtun tribes living in the north, west and center of the country. Tajiks and Hazaras are living amongst the Pashtun tribes in the east, southeast, and in the southern parts of the country. Though the long history of Afghanistan, sorry, through the long history of Afghanistan, all tribes live side by side. They had successful integration. Why, if there has been successful integration, are there so many problems now? All potential for order was disrupted when the Russians invaded Afghanistan and in the long civil war. Now, the parallel with our situation is this. All our ethnic groups, the 371 ethnic groups, were living adjacent to one another as good neighbors. 
we shared the territory. This was before we were lumped into political union, not by us, but by colonial invading powers. And he went on, this is the prophecy. He said, we have many problems with Al Qaeda and the Taliban in Afghanistan. They are aiming at one thing, and that is to prolong this nonsensical war. This is the war against the Americans. They want to stretch it out. They don't just fight, they lay suicide bombs, and some are shooting from a distance at coalition forces. But in some, all of these actions mean that they are prolonging the war. Their objective is to drain the wealth of the USA and of the other countries in the coalition. And this ends in many casualties for military personnel. There will be domestic pressure on the governments in those countries to pull out of Afghanistan. If this happens, it is very, very dangerous for us Afghans. Our country will be divided amongst the warlords that are still there. The country will go back to a deadly civil war and all the hopes for the developing this country will be lost, possibly forever. And in answer to your question, how do we move on this past work, your question, how do we move on from where we are now? Our Afghan tribal chief answered this in 2008 in reference to his own country. He said, the problem is that a so-called democratic government unfortunately failed. President Kazai might be a good man, but the people surrounding him before the fledgling democracy properly opened its eyes, the warlords hijacked the government. And so the people's hopes faded away. Now, as to what could be done, we need to give the lawyer Jirga a chance. We need to give the people of Afghanistan a chance in order to make decisions. We need to bring these tribes, these Afghans on board with this new government or any future government in order to solve the problem. Now the lawyer Jirga that he keeps referring to is our national conference. It is the nations, the ethnic groups, coming together to agree a basis of coexistence. He said further, he said about the philosophy, this is him talking, uh, expanding more on this concept of the lawyer Jirka. He said about the philosophy about the tribal chiefs, I don't think that happened in Afghanistan, not in the lawyer Jirka. There is representation of all the tribes there, in our case, ethnic groups. That's exactly what we're missing. We're missing the reintegration of all the tribes stroke ethnic groups. We're missing the trust that they had before in the time of the king. We had a peaceful time in, Afga in Afghanistan under the king for 40 long years. The main thing was the tribes worked with each other. That's what we're missing now. Some say Pashtuns are 70% of the population, but even if it is less than that, the majority is the majority, whether it is 50% or not, that is not important. What is important is that all these Afghan tribes work cooperatively with each other. That's what I meant before of integration. Now, that's him speaking about Afghanistan. But I speak about Nigeria in a way forward. And I speak in similar language, but perhaps more graphically. I say that what we need is a new union. 
but it's not a union of artificial states where we've drawn the boundaries of states in a way similar to the way the colonizing powers at the Berlin Conference drew the boundaries of countries in Africa, cutting natural unions down the middle, such that if you have Europe as in Benin Republic and you have uh, uh, Europe in Nigeria, you have uh, ethnic people in Cameroon and you have them in Nigeria. And the, this, the, it could be ex repeated, the examples could be explicit. Uh, explained again and again and again. And he said, Fern, he was explaining the tribes in Afghanistan. He said, he was asked a question, Chief Khan, could you clarify the role of the tribe in Afghanistan? How big a role it plays and how divisions could play a part? He said, we are all Afghans. In the same way as we say we are all Nigerians. We are Pashtuns, Persians, Tajiks, Hazaras, or Uzbeks, but we are all Afghans. This is the main point. Thank you for bringing that up. The integration of the tribes, we lost it at the time of the Russian invasion, and we lost it in the civil war. That's what we're aiming for in order to get everybody back on the platform. They have, they have to be one thing, and that is Afghans. Now, the Fatherland Group proposes that Nigerians will be one thing. They will be Nigerians. But they will be Nigerians in a different kind of way. They will not be forced to choose between being Yoruba and being Nigerian, or being Igbo and being Nigerian, or being Hausa and being Nigerian, or Ijo and being Nigerian. There will be Ijo and there will be Nigerians. There will be Hausa and there will be Nigerians. There will be Uguni and there will be Nigerians. It is not either or, it is plus. And the way to achieve that is what we call the unity of the orange. The unity of the orange is a different kind of unity from the unity of the apple. You see, both in their roundness represents unity and wholeness, do they not? Peel the skin of the apple, what do you see? You see an indistinguishable mass. Those, that is what we have been pursuing for those who are shouting one Nigeria, at least the sincere ones who wanted genuinely one Nigeria. They were pursuing the unity of the apple. They made our nations, our true nations, our regional ethnic groups, they made it a dirty word to say out loud that you're proudly Yoruba, or proudly Ijo, or proudly Kanuri. They wanted you just to be Nigerians and nothing more. But the unity of the orange is a beautiful alternative unity. Because when you peel the skin of the orange, what do you see? You see the segments of the orange sitting side by side. This is how we were in the Nigeria space before they tried to turn us into an apple by eliminating our individual ethnic national identities. We need to go back onto the path of respecting our differences and celebrating our differences such that we all bring the best of what we have. And those segments will be self-respecting and self-reinforcing because each segment, without one segment, the orange is not whole. The skin cannot wrap it as perfectly as it is when all the segments are there. And when all the segments are there, it is beautiful in its rounds. The outside world, that skin represents Nigeria on the fatherland model of the way forward. The skin represents Nigeria. But the segments underneath the skin, we're proud to be who we are. And we're comfortable being what we are. We're going back to the way we were 
where we existed side by side. So the British forced us closer together. We won't throw that away. We will take the benefits and the advantage of scale because it does give us advantages. But we would not throw away our individual identities because it's the attempt to crush and disrespect our individual identities that spews and spawns all conflict. When we say that we want to structure a superman who will come from one of our ethnic groups, but nevertheless would not belong to his group, you won't find this because that's not how the world works. In Europe, a Frenchman runs France, a German runs Germany, an Italian runs Italy. But they have that unity of the orange in the European Union. So they get the benefits of scale, but they get the ad advantage of variety and diversity. Let's stop being greedy politically and say that we want to be that indistinguishable mass. Because the only way to get to that indistinguishable mass is this. One group has to eliminate all the others. This is what happened in America. When people say, oh, but look at America, as many, many different peoples. Yes, of course it does. But it only achieved that by eliminating, uprooting and eliminating the indigenous peoples there. And then telling everybody else that is coming in, you come in on the basis of one identity, your loyalty to one flag, loyalty to one language, English language, one faith, Christianity, and one ethos, capitalism. That's why the citizenship tests are applied. You've got to get through and pass on all of those before you can become a citizen. And you come into the app on that basis. So this, our, our way forward is actually when we get to understand the root of our problem, which is what I always target. I don't go for surface level explanations, saying that, ah, oh, this group is, is, is greedy, and this, people, this group is, um, is, is, is wants to, um, uh, this group, this group is, is, cannot be trusted. Human beings are the same across the board. Let's start from that base. There's the good, the bad, and the other. Our job is to bring the good together. Our job is to design. This is a design challenge right now, because what we have, we have to come to terms with it. What we have has crashed. As I was, as I landed yesterday, I asked my driver, I haven't seen him since um, the beginning of the crisis, coronavirus. He's, from, he's a Christian from uh, Madiguru. I asked him, what is your assessment of the situation on ground? He said, sir, before we had hope, but now we don't have that anymore. That we see things happening that our leadership is supposed to speak to and respond to in order to deter, and our leadership is quiet, encouraging these excesses. So the vehicle has crashed, and it is time for the big thinkers, not the small thinkers. The small thinkers who just want to carry on and say it's going to take another thousand years of bloodshed before we get to the promised land. You know, the, the subtitle of my book, A Fatherless People, is how the Nigerians missed the road to the promised land. And people often ask me, what is the promised land? What did it look like? The promised land was very similar to where we began. All those nations, 371 ethnic groups in the surrounds of the river Niger, living comfortably side by side, ample resources 
each with their own leaders before those ethnic groups were decapitated. And the leaders like Jaja of uh, were sent into exile. And treaties of so-called protection were forced upon us. And if you didn't sign, you were deposed. You were either killed or you were exiled. And somebody who was ready to play along with the colonial adventurers would then be made your leader. So that is the root of the title of the book, A Fatherless People, because those who were made our political fathers were not our own fathers. That is how we got to where we are. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that analysis. I still have a few questions, but let me yield the floor to those who are raising their hands. A gentleman called Ademola has a question that they want to ask. Um, and somebody else had raised their hand, but I think they put the hand down. So Ademola, can you quickly ask your question or make your comment? Very quickly, please. We're running out of time. I certainly will. Uh, thank you for this uh, dialogue that we're having with Mr. Okun here. Um, the critical thing that I'm trying to find out, the social experiment of America in Afghanistan cost them more than a, a trillion dollars. Um, my, my take, and I don't know whether it's something that you have in the pipeline, is where Nigeria transitioned from in the 60s to become a failed state. Um, are you working on providing us a historical context uh, in terms of the players that were involved in, in, in the situation that we find ourselves today? I'm a child of the 60s and at that time, everything worked until the coups took place. Uh, I'm not emotional. Um, has nothing to do with religion here, but you know when you look at this, the players involved, um, I hope that you might be able to take that on and give us a historical context in a book, in a book form. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. Thanks, thanks, uh, Adimola. I, I, I've got good news for you. I've already done it. Uh, it is all explained in a fatherless people, because the story starts with abolition of the slave trade, as I explained earlier. But it takes us right up to the Jonathan administration. It takes us through the coups. Uh, and it, it takes us through the turning in our fortunes at the point of independence. Um, because that coup that happened on the 15th of January, 1966, was a turning point. But what people need to understand is that there was much more to it than we've been told. As I've said before, Nigeria is a crime scene and you've got to find the real criminals, not the ones who have been labeled the criminals. So we were told that it was uh, an Igbo coup. It's one of the issues that I wanted to tackle in the fatherless people. Was that correct or not? But let me just answer that very briefly with this, uh, pose this point. If, had it been an Igbo coup for the Igbos to grab power, let us remind ourselves who the leader of the coup was. It was Nzegu. Why, and bear in mind, Nzegu was the one who killed Saddam, according to the records, personally. And Saddam was the revered leader of the North. And Uzogu was, his nickname was Kaduna. But the interesting thing is that he received 
a military burial. His body was retrieved from the east. And he was, he was flown back to Kaduna, his love, and he was given a full state burial. Now, is that not curious? Is that not curious? As I said, it's a crime scene, and you've really got to study the evidence very, very carefully. From the, his biography that was written by uh, uh, General Lushegon of Asanjo, uh, you actually discover that Nzogu was a one Nigerianist. He did not believe in Biafra at all. He wrote to Abbasanjo that he was ready to build a new Nigerian army right there from within Biafra land. These are one of the mysteries. But as I said, uh, uh, Dimala, uh, all what I sought to do, because we needed to find a new way forward. We, we've been tripping ourselves up with arguments, beer parlor arguments, not based on real research. And so I did the research and I produced the evidence. And it is open to anyone who has superior evidence to now bring it forward. It's, it, this is the, the ultimate court case. I've presented the arguments for the defense in a fatherless people, in defense of our people, because we're the ones who are defending our reputation our integrity, which has been impugned by all sorts of narratives historically. Here we are answering back. So let them produce the evidence to counter what we've presented. Well, was it an Igbo coup or not? It was, not. It, what it, it, it was not. It was not. What was the work and the basis of the coup? And who are the spirits behind that coup? The, you see, what was the real spirit, as I said before, there's always a reason, a, a difference between what you see at the surface level, like the weapons of mass destruction and the excuse for taking um, Saddam out uh, as, as against the real reasons. Uh, the coup uh, was instigated. And bear in mind it happened, <laughs> it happened uh, roughly three days after the very first Commonwealth Heads of Government Conference that was held in Africa, and it was held in Lagos. Now, people tell me, even from the little we know about intelligence services, when heads of governments of the Commonwealth countries are coming to Nigeria in that January 1966, would they not have known what do you think the state of intelligence would have been if a coup was in the offing and the coup was being talked about openly? So what the coup did was this. The three regions, which had been a concession to the North because the North were threatening to pull out in 1954. This was after the uh, action group moved the motion for independence in 1953. That motion was demanding the end of colonial government, starting from 1956, that that should be the last rung of the colonial war. And the North, who were being groomed by the uh, the colonial office to take power were not ready. And indeed, uh, the British were wrong footed by this move. They didn't expect it because it was a private members' bill that was tabled uh, by the members of the action group. And the, uh, the Northern delegation blocked the motion. And when they were uh, they were now returning to the north when the debate was, uh, the session was adjourned in, uh, in, in commotion, in a state of commotion. They were returning to the north. Uh, their train was being stoned 
by Southerners. When Sadama returned to the north, he declared that he wanted nothing to do with the south. And that was always Sadama's position. In fact, he was not a one Nigerianist. If you listen to his interviews, he wanted nothing to do with the south. And it was to reassure Sadama and the north that they would not be dominated by the South, who had now had the advantage of earlier missionary education. Because bear in mind, the missionaries were blocked from going into the North. Uh, that was regard. So to reassure them, they now set up this uh, regional arrangement. And it was a loose federation. And an important detail was that on 1st of April, 1939, April Fool's Day, the ultimate April Fool's joke was played on Southern Nigerians. When what was Southern Nigeria, one political unit, which balanced Northern Nigeria, one political unit, it was one against one balance. Southern Nigeria was divided into Eastern region and Western region. So it wasn't a case of now in the South, one plus one equals two. It was half plus half. If you can get it together, may equal one that will balance the one North. And so the, that was a vital step to enabling the North to dance with the East and then dance with the West or dance with the West and then dance with the East. They only need to form an alliance with one or the other in order to control power. Now, but that was always gonna be dangerous with the three regions, because if each region was allowed to run according to its own values, the regions and the British colonial office knew it, that they would drift apart each running according to their own values. And what was really needed, because bear in mind at this point, oil, the discovery of oil had just been announced. And I use that word deliberately, announced, because the oil as fabulous, as I explained in fabulous, the oil was actually discovered in 1908 and were producing 2000 barrels of oil per day as of 1909. And that first field was not the one that they announced in 1956. But now, because empire or the, uh, the colony was due to be uh, dismantled, and Fabulous explains the real reason, there's always a difference between the reasons we're told and the real reasons for these developments. The real reason for decolonization was actually American pressure. But it, I'll end up giving you a very long answer to the question if I now go into that, but it's explained in the book. So the real reason for decolonization was not the winds of change speech that was delivered in 1961, but the pressure of the Americans in 1939, as early as 1939. In short, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the American president, made it clear to Churchill that there's no way that the Americans are going to enter the war against Nazi Germany just to prop up the British Empire. That the empire has to go. And this is what led to the Atlantic Charter of uh, 1941. And it was the Atlantic, if you read the Atlantic Charter, when we finish this discussion, Google it, you'll see that that was pledging the freedom of nations, self-determination. That was the root of the self-determination. It was the Americans who put that pressure. But there were reasons, which I explained in, in Fabulous, why independence did not come. India got its, its own independence in 47, I believe, but ours was delayed 
the rest of Africa was delayed on to Ghana in 57 and ours in 1960 and others around about the same time. So these are the deep explanations. So what the coup did was to return us to the unity of the apple because the free region structure, the loose federation that had been assured to Sadama to protect the North from domination by the South. That they knew would lead to, or ran the risk of the plates drifting apart. So in order to bring it back in, that's what the coup achieved. And what we ended up was military rule. And now we've ended up with what is effectively, there's a phrase that I came across very recently. Uh, uh, it was what is effectively colonial democracy. So we've got this grand document called the Constitution, uh, but in actual fact, it is it is pseudo colonial uh, that effectively uh, we have, and it's, again that's relevant to the Afghan situation because when following the American invasion in two thousand and one. Um, the next step was for them to establish a democratic government. And the model of democratic government that was introduced was the uh, American presidential system, notwithstanding all that diversity similar to our own. And the lessons from Afghanistan is this, that after $1 trillion spent and 20 years of forceful presence. That democracy that doesn't actually reflect the reality has fallen apart and the Taliban is back. Sorry, Demola, I ended up with a very long explanation to your very short question. Yeah, I'm going to take a question from my brother, Anthony. It was great to see you in Lagos. I want to assume that you're probably back in the US. Uh, and I, or are you still in Lagos? Anyway, it was great to catch up with you in Lagos and thank you for stopping by. So I'm going to be taking a question from you and then from Afola Biajidao. But I want to take uh, Dele up on something that he didn't quite say, but I caught an insinuation. Are you saying that that coup was externally influenced or inspired, most likely by the British? or the Americans. I want you to be as specific as you can to that question. And then- yes, the, all, the evidence, all the evidence points to uh, external uh, agenda as far as that crew is concerned, uh, all the evidence. And you almost have to work backwards. When you now look at the war, um, we deceive ourselves and some of our people uh, deceive themselves in saying that the, the North, it was a fight between the North and the Igbos. Well, it wasn't. It was the Igbos, unfortunately, fighting, uh, fighting the British uh, because of the, the weaponry and the, and the tactics. Uh, where did it all come from? It was in the fabulous, I explained it as Harold Wilson's war, right down to this detail. Uh, we all know that, according to the conventional accounts, Ojuku escaped uh, in the closing stages of the war, just before the surrender. That's what the conventional narrative explains. And it's a fact. He left the country. But when you read Harold Wilson's uh, memoirs, you will see that he said uh, that's, uh, that Ojuku should be allowed to escape. <laughs> that language that was used that it should be allowed to slip through your fingers. And lo and behold, what happens? The narrative then comes that he escapes because they want to run the narrative of a coward who betrayed his people, uh, whereas it was scripted. So 
So these are the new, the new hard facts that we need to come to. I mean, what's happened has happened. And we can't change what has happened. But what we can do is to understand what has happened. Uh, what's and all in order for us to find the correct path forward. Otherwise, we will continue to point fingers at ourselves and blame ourselves. Um, uh, for things, in fact, one of the quotes that I came across recently, what, what, which book did I find it in? It was actually, again, in Lugard's biography by, uh, written by Marjorie Parham. Uh, there was a quote, beautiful quote in there to say, if I find it before the end of the program, I'll, I'll share it. If essentially, it's saying that the way to rule these native peoples, uh, the person who has the ability to get them to do what you want them to do, but believing that they are doing it of their own initiative, is the one that can control these people most effectively. And that quality was said that Lugard had that quality. It was a Lord Stanmore that was speaking. Uh, in the House of Commons, so it's it's in Hansard. It's not it's not made up. Uh, that's it's puppeteering. It's indirect rule. Uh, this is the reality of it, and this is what we've got to understand and understand very quickly. No more playing around with fancy explanation, woolly explanations. We've got to get to the hard facts uh, of what we really have. Thank you very much. I'd like to take three questions in a row so that you can respond to them all at once. And then, and then oh my goodness, we've run totally out of time, my goodness. Okay, we'll take these last three questions in a row and we will conclude, believe me sincerely, we have run out of time. So Anthony Afolabi Ajidao and Taiwo Ayedu, uh, what I'd like to promise Dele is that we're gonna to have to have you back on this platform your depth of research and knowledge and information is something that we really need to work with. So I'm going to ask Anthony Afolabi and Taiwo to ask their questions in quick succession. I want you to give very quick and straight answers to them. And then I would ask for your closing shots and we will round up for today. Thank you. Anthony, please go ahead. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Um, the question I have, it has to do with the damage that we are doing to ourselves. You know, I hear all this about the history. I can't really change the history and uh, everybody in the world, everyone has their history. But what I see as a person growing up as a human being, the damage we were doing to ourselves far outweighs, you know, uh, anything else as far as I'm concerned. Because if you look at our politics, our materialism, our just wickedness, selfishness is so excessive that it contradicts the people with this kind of history. So what do you have to say about the actual damage, the immeasurable damage that we're doing to ourselves, either by being tribalistic or not being united and so on and so on. Otherwise we will not be in this mess right now, regardless of what forces we face or what history we have. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. He's going to answer that question, but I can tell you straight away that we are all largely ignorant. Anyway, he will answer it himself. Afolabi, uh, your question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, good evening. Yes, speaker, good evening. Good evening, everybody. My question is, I want to hear, because I was a bit confused, complete clarification. Was it not the French that originally abolished slavery and then Napoleon reinstated it. And then the second thing that I want to clarify, this uh, um, Afghanistan war that took 20 years was costing the US $300 million a day. It cost the US $2 trillion in total tendency, not $1 trillion. Thank you, that's all. Thank you. I just want a bit of that uh, $300 million. <laughs> Taiwo, your question, please. Taiwo, are you doing, are you there or you took a, a break? Okay, maybe he's not there. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Dele, please respond to these two questions. Something about the damage we're doing to ourselves, uh, even as ourselves because of evil. Can we not wake up and smell the coffee? I think that's what Anthony is asking about. And um, Afolabi wants clarification as to who really ended the slave trade and the cost of the Afghanistan war. Uh, yes. Um, the damage we're doing to ourselves. I, I was hoping to find that quote because that would be the best answer to uh, Anthony. But let me say this, that of course, um, of course, there are Nigerian actors in this whole saga. Uh, how many Brits were in the country. Not many. But it's in the nature of colonialism that you study the peoples that you wish to colonize. You study them carefully and you identify their qualities. You will find the ones who will receive the allure of money. You will find also, I never suggested, uh, that um, there were no Nigerian hands in that misfortune, or that there are no Nigerian hands. Even God works through human agents doesn't physically come onto the ground and do carry out his designs. It is through us humans that those designs are carried out. My focus is on not the puppets and the actors on the stage. The focus in my writings is on the playwright. Who is writing? And that is what we've got to that's what we've got to learn to focus on. And, and I still hope that I'll find that quote uh, that I've been desperately looking for. Uh, Afalabi, uh, was it, it was the French who abolished slavery and Napoleon who reinstated it. As I explained earlier, it was actually the Africans, Toussaint Louverture, who abolished slavery in Haiti. <laughs> It was the Africans who abolished it. The French National Assembly then responded in order to pull the Africans, the now free Africans of Haiti, to pull them on side against the British, William Pitt, the, the younger, who was now looking to take Haiti into English control. It was to win Toussaint and his now free peoples over that the French National Assembly then uh, uh, passed the, the decree abolishing slavery. Now, what then happened was that Napoleon refused to accept the compromise that Toussaint offered, which was, look, I've, yes, I've abolished slavery, we won't go back to that way of life. We're not going to accept it. We've won our freedom. Come to terms with it. But I've unified the island. I've stabilized this. I've drawn up a constitution. I will be president for life to stabilize it further. After me, five year terms of presidency. But I'm not declaring Haiti independent. I'm still loyal to France. Napoleon rejected that compromise and tried to invade 43,000 invading army he raised to try and take Haiti back forcibly and reintroduce them. It did not succeed in reintroducing slavery in Haiti. He failed in the attempt because Af our people won. So that, that's the explanation, but it's all in a slave ship uh, called Jesus. 
it's all ex explained. Uh, Taiwo was trying to get through with his question. He wasn't able to unmute himself. So, uh, Pastor Itua, you may want to allow him. Okay, so I think we'll just conclude here. We've run more than uh, several minutes over our usual time. I want to thank everyone for staying the course. We is Taiwo still available to ask his question? Taiwo wants to ask his question. If he can be unmuted, please. To unmute himself. He's from he wasn't able to do so. I think the control is from the um, primary laptop. Are you unmuting yourself? Because <laughs> I know how to do it. I think he doesn't know how to unmute himself. That's the problem. Falabi unmuted himself. He can type his question. Uh, most people have unmuted themselves. So th there's a control, really, but they will have to unmute everybody and then mute everybody again. So he should look for the unmute button and unmute himself, or he should type his question. Then uh, somebody. Okay, so somebody suggesting that we should all join this group and take back our country. Which brings me to the question I want to ask Dele. What specifically can we do as Nigerians, as individuals, to, as it were, take back Nigeria and ensure good governance going forward? And what specific role would you daily like to play in this whole thing? Because time is ticking. The nation is not going forward. You commented about our exchange rates just now. And it seems as if our puppet masters are still succeeding in putting some kind of puppeteers in government, if I may use that French. So what do we do? Everybody looks powerless in Nigeria now. We don't have the guns, we don't have the money, we don't have the ammunition. A lot of us have been shot out as it were, even from the so-called political class uh, who are still controlling our destiny. A lot of them under various kinds of influences. So what do we do? How do we reverse this situation and what role do you want to play daily in this whole thing? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, the answer uh, in terms of how is this. This problem was created by humans, intelligent human beings. The problem will be solved by intelligent human beings. Mm -hmm. It's like a maths problem. When you understand it, you can solve it. If you don't understand it, you're likely to compound it. So you must first, and we must first, pursue understanding of the problem. That means we must read urgently, quickly, reading clubs, book clubs, discussion clubs, yes. such that there's a pool of information. Mm -hmm. and people like to Dis themselves a lot by saying, oh, we keep talking grammar, we keep talking grammar. Intelligent action must be preceded by intelligent thoughts and reflection. And it's not sufficient to talk to yourself. You must talk to your peers. You must teach the education which they took off the curriculum. They knew why they did it when they took history off the syllabus. And even when they say they'll bring history back on the syllabus, but what kind of history? Is it the narrative that will empower and liberate? Or is it the narrative that will confuse and leave you in the condition and our children in the same condition? So there's an urgent quest. They did not get to where they are because they have two heads or two brains. They simply exercised the brains that they had, but they were led by the mavericks, the greedy ones. We will be led by the good amongst our people. 
We must empower them, and you empower them much more powerful than any AK-47s. It's the power of knowledge. The truth shall set us free. And it must be the truth that we pursue without apology and relentlessly. And in terms of my role, I flatter myself in saying that I think I'm already doing that role, which is to go and search the information out, put it together for our people to fast track their understanding so that you don't have to go and read the 80 books that I read. You only need to go and read the one Hello? that is brought of the yeah, eight. Yeah. Yeah. Only us. Uh. That is, uh, you only need to read the one that has brought the contents of the eight, distilled it. And if you then want to read further, the footnotes are there. Let's get the reading clubs going. The leaders of faith can really fast track this exercise mm -hmm. because our people are running to the gym looking for the six pack of the stomach. But in these times, what we need is the six pack of the mind. Mm -hmm. We need the brains to be taken to the gym to exercise them. We've got flabby and lazy, content with what we've heard. Don't be content with what I've said to you this evening. Feed yourself by reading it. Feed your eyes by reading it. That is the ultimate gift. What put the ultimate gift that distinguishes man from beast is the ability to think, the ability to reflect, and the ability to study. Let's make a resolution for a new Nigeria. Because I know that Nigerians do want to be Nigerians in their heart of hearts. They want Nigeria to work. They love the concept of Nigeria because by instincts, we are generous souls and generous spirits. That is the reality of the African. We have abundance and we say, we have abundance, come in. That's what we said to them when they came. You're looking for shelter, you've been on the oceans, come in. You want food, come in. But we must learn quickly the evils of the world or the ways of the evil ones. We need to fast track that knowledge. So everything that the leaders of faith and pastors were, uh, uh, this is part of that exercise and I had the pleasure of uh, dining with Pastor Paul Adifaris in the other day, similarly on, on message, that this is how our leaders of faith can become relevant once more to our people in these times of crisis. Teach, teach, teach. Each one teach the other. And we'll all get there together so much faster. So uh, that's as I see my role. It is not to run for any office. That's not my role. There are any number that can run for office, but we cannot all teach the same way. We don't all have the patience to do the, the learning and then pass the knowledge. I'm content to play that role, to pass the knowledge on, so that we can then share knowledge and perfect knowledge. And when we have that, we then have a clear way forward. No AK-47s can kill us all. But with knowledge, we will win. With knowledge, we will win. On that note, my brother Dele, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know how long you're in Lagos for, but I think you and I should have a private meeting and we can discuss a bit further. I'd like to thank everyone for being on board today. I really am grateful to you. Uh, Dele, thank you very much for all the work and all the energy that you have put in getting this knowledge, putting it together, reading all those books and freely making it available uh, for all who really want. God bless you. Uh, everybody's giving you a thumbs up. 
And I'm sure yes, I am. I am too. wonderful. <laughs> Everybody is giving you a thumbs up. That's my auntie, Professor. Yes, Give excellent. Very Thank sad. you, Itwa, for bringing him. Thank you. It's well, been so um, uplifting. Gives one hope. Yeah. Yeah, I Thank think you. understanding the genesis of the problem makes Right. You have to get to the root. Yes, exactly. And like you said, a lot of people just don't understand pepper soup conversation. But 